Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. You going, Miss Avery? Go on. She's waiting. Glad you could be here with us today. Um, be glad you're inside. Where um, it's not overly hot. Because if we was outside today, I'd melt. And Matthew would just sit and sweat into himself a big puddle. So, days like today, especially the next three days, you can be thankful we got air conditioning. Um, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, uh, we are going to be, I'm going to be in 2 Samuel, you may be in Psalms. Um, and the reason doing, uh, reasoning doing so, I, I desire to split your attention this morning um, for uh, just the sake of, I can tell you the story and you can read the aftermath. But uh, those things being said, I know that's kind of going to be confusing this morning and uh, a lot of us can't split and divide our attention. Um, I feel bad asking you to do so. Some of you don't pay attention to me on a regular basis, let alone when I ask you to split it. So uh, we'll just kind of have to deal with it as it is. Uh, last Sunday night, though, last Sunday, we, uh, uh, we, we, we met here Sunday night and we talked about forgiveness. Do you guys recall that? Those who were here, we, we recall a conversation about forgiveness. Today, uh, we are going to expand upon that. Uh, we're going to continue looking at that. And uh, what I, I desire you to know today is that, one, God still loves you. I don't care what you did, God loves you. I want you to know that uh, it doesn't matter where you've come from in life, God loves you. God sent His Son to die for you. The Bible tells us that, uh, uh, that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That does not change. I want you to know that, that all that is relevant no matter where we go and where we are in life. Those things are important for you and I to know. That it, that it, it doesn't... It doesn't matter. It does, but it doesn't matter. I need you to know that wherever you go in life, God loves you. He's the, you cannot change the fact that God sent His only begotten Son to the cross to die for you. You cannot change that. I don't care what you do in life, what kind of bad you do in life, you can't change it. God still sent His Son to die for you. I need you to know that. That is something so important that I can't, I can't hammer that to you enough here this morning. But what I also want you to know is even though God loves you and even though God will forgive you, even though the Bible tells us that God cannot lie, and if He tells you that He will cleanse you from all unrighteousness, He will. If it tells you whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, that's all you've got to know. You are a whosoever. All those things are important. But what I need you to know is that the Bible tells us in the book of Romans that the wages of sin is death. We understand that. And if some sins, if you continue in, can bring about a physical death. Sin in and of itself, if you never seek repentance of, brings about a spiritual death, which would be the second death that we're not going to get into. But I need you, if I could give it to you this way, if you are once born, you're twice dead. But if you're twice born, you only have to die once. That's deep. Most of you may not get that. You may not understand that. If you want to know what that means, study out your Bible. You'll find it. You'll find it from John 3.16. You'll get it from there. You'll find out what I'm talking about in being twice born and only once dead. But let's move on. How many of you have ever done something bad? 
Well, the Bible says that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So if we try that again, everybody in the house is going to raise your hand. Everybody in the room, the one thing we all have in common is we've all sinned. Every person here, I don't care where you come from, I don't care where you was born, I don't care how you was raised, I don't care who your family is, who they, uh, how great your mama was, how good your daddy is, or who your pa was, I want you to know our commonality is we're all sinners. The other place we can find the same commonality is that we are all saved by the grace of God. None of us are, are going to attain salvation in any other way than by the grace of God through faith. That's it. We're common. We're all alike in those manners. But every person here has done something bad. And I don't care who you are. You've done something. I am going to be reading and talking about a man named David this morning. And as we talk about David, many of you know that I'm going to be in uh, 2 Samuel around chapters number 12 is where I'm going to be. Where do you think you might be? Psalms 51. Good job, Matthew. I'm glad you, you. I think you're the only person here that ever listens to me. <laughs> but let's talk about David for a minute. What do we know about David? David was a man after God's own heart. That's what the Bible tells us. David was a, a, a as a young man was willing to stand up against a giant in his land that was mocking his God. David was a man who uh, uh, spent quite a bit of time on the run from a king named Saul. When Samuel came to anoint the next king, he went, to, he, he went over there to the family farm and all the brothers came forth and he says, well, ain't none of these. Is there one other? And they all kind of, <laughs> David, but we know it ain't him. He's somewhere out yonder doing whatever it is he's doing. But it was David. David was, uh, uh, in his life, David was a musician. David was uh, a man of many talents. David was maybe the most famous songwriter that has ever been. But David was a man, even after he was a man of God's own heart, David was a man with a ton of skeletons in his closet. David was a man who was lazy as a king, at least in a certain season. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. After uh, uh, he, he took over, and just for sake of time, we're going to phrase it that way, as he took over for Saul, he had all of Saul's wives. He had all of Saul's kingdom, his, uh, his fortunes, everything that he had, David received. David had absolutely anything you could think of. He was a king. And he was a king and he was the ruler of God's chosen people. But while David was being lazy and just hanging out in the company of others and, you know, so telling war stories and this, that, and the other, and, uh, uh, you know, in a time when he was supposed to be out to battle, but he's just hanging back and, uh, uh, you know, I guess just being the popular guy for a little bit, David is uh, hanging out there and uh, he, he, something catches his eye. And that something was a someone. And that someone was Bathsheba. And that someone was also married. But David was the king. And in those days, it didn't really matter who you was, what your circumstances was. You didn't tell the king no. But David had saw Bathsheba. The Bible tells us that he saw her bathing on the roof and he, uh, he, he, he thought she was beautiful. He thought that she was just the greatest thing ever. So he sins for her. And if we start tallying up the sins that David has done, number one, he's not being obedient to God because he's not where he's supposed to be. And because he's not where he's supposed to be, he sees something he should have never saw. Because he's seen something he should have never saw, then he coveted that, he lusted after it, he had desire of it, he wanted it, so he sent for it. Now all these things start compiling one upon another. And then before you know it, he, he has had uh, Bathsheba's come to his house. The Bible tells us that they had, uh, uh, that they had slept together. They had an intimate relationship at this point. They had, a, uh, uh, they had an affair. This was, uh, this was days of our lives long before days of our lives. 
It had started happening then. As adults, what can happen if two people sleep together? Pregnancy. Guess what Bathsheba did? She got pregnant. Oh man, this is this is bad. This is bad. Oh, I'm David. I'm the king of Israel. Oh, I wasn't where I was supposed to be. Oh, what's people going to say? Not to even count that I, I, re, I know her husband. I know him well. We're pounds. Huh. And he's one of my best warriors. Well, I got to send him to the front of the line and he can't come back. I ain't making it up. Read your Bible. It's in there. Second Samuel. Find it. Read it. David sends Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. She, he sends him to the front of the line. He sends him to a spot that he absolutely knows he's not going to return. He says, I'll need you to send him into the heaviest, hottest battle with the, 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 the least amount of resources. I need you to send him there, and I need to know when he's dead. That's what I need. That's what I need from you, messenger. Go about your little way and carry this out for me. So now David is not where he's supposed to be. He's seen something he wasn't supposed to see. Uh, he 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 coveted that. He lusted after it. He brought her in to him. He had, uh, he had an affair. He, uh, uh, he, he, he took another man's wife. He got her pregnant. Uh, and then he, then he commits murder. He doesn't necessarily go out and stick the knife in his back to kill him, but he has a man killed. He does all these things. And friend, let me go back and remind you, this is a man after God's own heart. This was David. And David had done all those things. Sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? But again, how many of you have done something bad? But here, we're, now we're about to get to the meat and potatoes part because I want you to know, if you read in Psalms 51 while I'm talking, if you skim through that, you know that God will forgive you. But the effects of sin, or let me throw this word at you, the consequences are still there. If you get plum blistered one night, you're hammered, and you get in your car and you drive home and you get your DUI, you can ask God to forgive you. And friend, let me tell you what God's going to do. God will forgive you. You me tell you what you still got to do? You still have to go to court. You still have to face those charges. Even though God has forgiven you, you still have the consequence of what you've done. Those things are still there. That's what we're going to look at here this morning as I'm going to begin reading here in 2 Samuel. I'm going to begin in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse number 13 is where I'm going to start. This is going to be after all the things that we had just talked about. But the Bible says this, if you want to read with me, you can, and then you're welcome to turn to Psalms 51. But it will be 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse number 13. The Bible says, And David said unto Nathan, Nathan being the prophet of God, this is uh, the messenger, if you will, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord hath put away thy sin, and thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast giving great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. 
Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came to the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before you again here this morning, Father, it is again our, our, our pleasure, Father, to be in your presence here this day. Father, we are honored to sit in your house. Father, honored to, uh, to be able to open and read your word, uh, Father, and just uh, to be able to hear uh, your word preached. Father, we're thankful, Lord, for the presence of the Spirit here this day, Lord, that, uh, uh, that, that we are not alone as we sit here, but Father, you, uh, you, you promised to send another unto us, Father, and uh, uh, that promise would be the comfort of the Holy Ghost. Uh, uh, Father, we're thankful, Lord, that you, that, that you gave him to us, Lord, that we are able to, uh, to interpret your word, Father, to be able to, uh, to, to, to attain and gather, Lord, all the things, the, the hidden things of your word, Father, that we need to know. But, Father, we just ask you. Father, that no matter uh, what circumstances, Lord, befall us, Lord, we're just uh, uh, thankful, Lord, in knowing, God, that uh, uh, you are you are a, a, a gracious and a merciful God, Lord, and uh, uh, willing to forgive us, Father. Forgive us for anything, Lord, in which we have done. All we all we have to do, Father, is to, uh, your word said is, is to repent, Father, Lord, just to, uh, to ask for that forgiveness, Father, to seek it and we shall find, Lord. We're thankful for those things, but God, we're thankful, Lord, uh, too, for your righteousness, Lord, and uh, uh, being just, Lord, and all uh, all of your word coming true, that Lord, no matter the things that we have done, the Bible says that, uh, uh, that, that, that you, you, uh, uh, you, you punish, Lord, those that you love. Father, we're just thankful, God, for your love unto us, Lord, that uh, uh, we don't just wander about with no, uh, uh, no forms of conviction and no forms of, uh, uh, of, of, of chastisement, Lord, the things that we must endure. But Father, we're just thankful for everything that you've done for us. God, we just pray that you meet with us here this morning, that you, that you speak into our hearts here this day. God, I love you and I praise you and I ask all these things in your son Christ Jesus name. Amen. Of all the things that David had done, of all that David had done, as you said in there, uh, and you've got Psalms 51 open into your laps, you can uh, begin to read through that and uh, uh, you can feel the heaviness of David's heart in looking at Psalms 51. If you read those words, you, you, you realize that David truly knew that he had done wrong. You know uh, that, that, that David was uh, sorry for what he had done. He pled out these things. If you look in 2 Samuel here in the events that had happened as, uh, as Nathan the prophet, the man of God, as he had come to David and told him what was going to happen, it says that David had said that he went away and uh, what he had done is he had put on the sackcloth, the ashes. He had done everything that he's supposed to do to be in mourning. He, uh, he fasted. He done all these things to show God, Lord, please just intervene on my behalf. I realize that I have done wrong. I know that there is a, a, a plenty that I have done in this. But what I need you to do, Lord, I, just, I need you to forgive me for these things. I know you, Lord. I know you sent your prophet to tell me. That the son that I'm going to have by way of an illegitimate relationship, by way of this affair, I know, Lord, you've told me that he's not going to make it. How many of you would you not still pray for the child? Every single one of us would. How many of you, when we, ha when we have been convicted, whenever chastisement has come and you get into Hebrews around the sixth chapter, you get in there and you start talking about chastisement and knowing that those that the Lord loves, that chastisement will come unto him. And if we just live however we want to and chastisement never comes, the Bible uh, it plainly tells you and I, it says that we are not sons. In living a life of however you want to live, when chastisement, when things don't happen, when there's no conviction, there's no punishment of any kind, I want you to know that the Bible tells you and I that we're not the sons. Well, preacher, what does that mean? That is so confusing to me. The Bible tells you and I that we will know that we are saved. One way that I know that I am saved is, friend, when I do wrong, conviction comes. When conviction comes, chastisement comes. And I don't care how many times I repent and how many times I ask God to forgive me, but I want you to know that uh, uh, by, by, by the very uh, sin that may have been done, that sets things in motion. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. So there's a consequence to the sin that we have. Just because God forgives you doesn't mean that the consequences go away. If there were never consequences... 
every single one of us to live how we wanted to without fear if you didn't have to worry about going to jail if you killed somebody everybody in here would probably kill somebody if it made you mad enough amen if you didn't have to worry about uh, uh, laws and rules and the uh, consequences thereof, we would never obey them. If you never had to worry about getting a speeding ticket, you'd drive however fast you wanted to drive, wherever it is you wanted to go. You'd pick whatever side of the road that you felt comfortable driving on, and you'd just drive there without fear of anything. I have stopped people before for speeding, and they begin to plead their case. I am so sorry. I, I didn't realize how fast I was going. I didn't realize that this was a 25. Okay. I get that. I understand it. But do you realize that there's businesses around here? Yeah? You realize that people cross the road right here all the time? Yeah? So why would you do 60? Well, I just wasn't paying no attention. So now you're going to tell me you're going to admit to careless driving and recklessness. Oh, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. You can ask for forgiveness all day long, but it doesn't change the fact of what you did. We understand that as a people. But when we think of God, oftentimes our imagery and our thought process of God is this, uh, uh, you know, this, this jolly old man. That uh, is just uh, happy-go-lucky, if you will. And any time you ask for forgiveness, it's just, why, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Got you. And then we just go. Well, that wasn't too bad. I asked God to forgive me, and just like the Word says, He forgave me. So, no harm, no foul. Right? But go back to David. David was a man after God's own heart, and he knew the law. He knew everything that he needed to do. He knew all the right from wrong. Friend, he, was, uh, he may have been better equipped and uh, uh, better uh, uh, suited in the Word than any of us. And he knew all these things, but yet he still went forth and he'd done the evil and he'd done the wicked that he'd done. And then he says, I have sinned against the Lord. He admitted and he confessed. You read Psalms 51, it also says that he believed. But you get in through there and oftentimes what we want to do, you want me to tell you how I know what we want to do? Because it's what I do. I told you, we're all common ground here. We're all sinners saved by grace. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We know these things. So oftentimes, when we do something bad, you got to counter that with doing something good. I'm going to ask God to forgive me, and then I'm going to be a little extra good for a few days. I may witness a little more. And so when somebody sneezes, I may say, God bless you, instead of just bless you. Yep, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to promote the kingdom. I'm going to go forth and I'm going to live a good life and I'm just going to let my little light shine for about three or four days. David's case, about seven. Oh, and I'm going to be sad and I'm going to mourn. I may even fast. But wait, they got some specials down there at the place I like to eat, so maybe, if I, maybe I won't fast. I got two for one coupons. I can't fast. So we'll just go through these motions here. But you read through Psalms 51 and what David is writing in the song there that he's writing and the plea that he is saying, what David says is, Lord, you don't care about our sacrifices. It doesn't matter about all the things that I do. It doesn't matter that if I, I'm going to go forth and I'm going to be the jolliest little Christian that you've ever seen and I, uh, my light's going to be brighter than anybody else's. If I don't have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, if it's not something that is affecting me on the inside, my outward appearance means absolutely nothing. Nothing. And that is exactly what David says in writing that. It doesn't matter of the sin that we've done. God's going to forgive us. It tells us that, that he's going to blot out our transgressions, that he's going to make us white as snow. It even tells us that God is going to forget them. But it never tells you and I that the consequences go away. Jesus came... And he lived an absolute perfect life. He done absolutely nothing wrong. 
There was no sin, there was no guile found in his mouth. There was nothing perfect. God could have looked down on him and smiled in his fortune and said, Son, since you have done so good, don't worry about the cross. You don't have to do that. Because you've lived this good life, and that's just going to outshine anything. We ain't got to worry about pouring out my wrath on nobody. You've done good enough. We ain't got to worry about no punishment. God never said that. Jesus knew that he was coming. He knew that he was coming to live a perfect life. He knew the example that he had to do. The Bible tells us all about that. The Bible tells us all about his life and his ministry and the things that he had done. But friend, even though Jesus was so good and even though he followed the perfect will of the Father that he had done every single thing exactly to the specifications that God wanted, I want you to know Jesus still went to the trump because, or to the cross because there's still consequences for sin. There are still consequences for sin. Jesus didn't do anything, but he had to take our consequences. He took the wrath of God, because you and I can't. We get upset. Lord, why is this happening to me? Sometimes the Bible teaches us that it rains on the just as well as the unjust. Sometimes it's just life and things happen. Other times you and I know exactly why it's happening, but we refuse to admit it. It ain't fair. It ain't fair that I have to go through this. Was it fair to an infant child? Was it fair to David and Bathsheba's child? If you want to talk about fairness, it wasn't fair to him, though, was it? But God is a just God, and he had told him, because of this iniquity, because of this sin, this is going to happen. He also said, because of all these things, the sword will never leave your family. It says, because of these things, that other people will come in and take your wives, and they will have relations with them openly, and it will be an embarrassment unto you. The Bible says, because of what you've done, all these things are going to happen, and it may not be fair, but it wasn't fair to Uriah either, who was out on the battlefield when you took his wife. How was that fair? Well, God, you got a good point there, but bottom line is, Lord, I don't want to have to deal with it. Bottom line is, Lord, I don't want to have to accept the consequences. And even though we may fast, even though we may, uh, we, we may weep, we cry, we pray, sin was very specific. And the effects of are very specific. And God has said himself, as he, as he inspired men to write, To whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth deal with you as with sons. I bust my kids' hind ends. And it ain't because I just love to whoop them. Sometimes my mom and sisters may disagree with that. But I whoop them because I love them. I want them to know when you do this, this happens. And God's the same way. He does it because he loves us. It said, Then David arose from the earth, and he washed and anointed himself, and changed his apparel, and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Why? Paul writes for us to glory in tribulations. That's what Paul told us to do. David was able to do so. David just lost a child. David had his best friend murdered. David had done all these things, but he still went to the house of God and he worshipped because God was just, because God was righteous, because what God said came true. Friend, when we endure chastisement, we can get mad and pout about it all we want to, but what we really need to do is say, glory to God, your word is true, and what you have said is going to happen has happened. I know you're real. Many times we just say, I don't know why it's happening. 
I don't know why I have to go through this. Life ain't fair. This is cruel. What other phrases do we use? What ones do you use? The Bible tells us that God won't put more on us than we can bear. And he also says that he'll make a way of escape. Friend, you can be thankful that you have a friend in Jesus. That you have someone to bear your burdens. That you have someone to lead you through the wilderness. That you have someone to guide you. Let's stand together this morning as we prepare to close.